It's the 18th of April, 2018, and this is API Conversations number 10, a conversation with Chris Cogswell. This is your host, Paul Carr, and it's our pleasure to welcome Chris Cogswell tonight. Chris is the recently resigned Director of Research at MUFON, the second Director of Research to resign in about a year. I won't go deeply into the story of why he resigned. Uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm when Chris joined MUFON as their Director of Research that he could bring really much needed reform and positive influence on their research direction. But, uh, and the reason he resigned was not because of that, uh, but for other reasons that uh, we'll have links to in the show notes. But uh, he is continuing with his research, as you'll hear tonight. And I th thought I'd like to bring him on and talk about the future of UFO research, some of the things we can do in the near term to really get to some good answers and better questions about these phenomena and, and try to get a better handle on exactly what it is we're dealing with. Not what are UFO propulsion systems or what kind of aliens are behind the wheel, but the more fundamental questions that we are not correctly addressing. And we'll talk about some of those tonight. And I, I appreciate his philosophical as well as his scientific bent. And I think that he, he understands both well and he will bring that to the field. And you should continue to monitor what he's up to as well as us here at Aerial Phenomena Investigations. We'll, we'll keep an eye on what he's up to and help him out when he needs the kind of thing we do to help. So uh, this is recorded on the 18th of April, 2018, and Chris Cogswell. Hello, Chris. Hello, how's it going? Good. Uh, Chris, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this field? Sure. So I am a, uh, so basically I have been interested in sort of, you know, the strange and unusual since I was a young, uh, young kid, you know, and as I got older, I knew that I wanted to do research kind of at the cutting edge of science and also sort of at the cutting edge of philosophy and this area that I find so fascinating where these, uh, the interplay between science and non-science or fringe science, let's say, these kind of three things come together, right? You have the world of academic science, you have the world of kind of where science is going or areas of potential, you know, new technologies. And then you also have kind of this, uh, this, this other world of pseudoscience and, uh, you know, trying to pin down where those regions are and how they work together and how the public views science through the lens of those three things has always been fascinating to me. So, you know, when I did my uh, bachelor's degree, I did it in philosophy and chemical engineering, and then I did graduate work uh, in chemical engineering, focusing on nanotechnology. And, you know, it just kind of all came together. And uh, I started a podcast, the Mad Scientist podcast, and was very fortunate to be invited to uh, kind of take part in the research kind of stuff that I was talking about on the show and really start to apply some real science to this stuff. And uh, and that's kind of where where we are now, I guess. Yeah, and your 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 podcast goes into some sort of uh, crazy areas of science, uh, not related yeah. to UFOs for the most part, but for sure, yeah, no, we we go into uh, we go in all kinds of weird things. You know, we we kind of you know we span the the whole range of of science and non science and new science. So it's pretty it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, well, that, that kind of leads me into a problem that I that I've seen quite a bit. You know, you mentioned pseudoscience, and it, it's a brush that everything gets tarred with. Uh, now, it's clear that nothing in the UFO area could be considered normal science, right? I mean, we don't have an established paradigm. We don't have a set of solid experiments that we can hang our hat on. Mm -hmm. Some would say we have nothing at all. So, you know, uh, where, where, where is that, e even in the best case? So I would say the interesting thing is that we have a lot of excited people who want to take part in this investigation. 
and a lot of data out there, but really no, like you mentioned, no um, kind of standard operating procedures, no specific testing codes and things that we abide by. No, I mean, even as something as simple as say, you know, um, what counts as good evidence in this field is not known yet. Right. Right. And so kind of that's part of the challenge that we're trying to focus on is how do we start picking up picking apart at this problem and really start from basic principles because you know in some ways ufology you know kind of hit the ground running right but it started running before it could walk and so we've kind of been looking at these big cases and looking at these things and you know uh, delving into some very fascinating evidence you know but there is no backbone there is no like you said no paradigm no starting point from which we can kind of build our field up but there really is a lot of very good, I think, scientific uh, scientific, and kind of just generally academic, not even just scientific, but historical, sociological, um, psychological even. There are good places that we can kind of, you know, put this field and kind of start building up what we would consider to be the study of, of UFOs or UFO phenomena. Yeah, now, uh, the – about 99 – 0.9% of what we have to work with in this field are the wit witnesses' memories, right? Yeah. Uh, perceptions, uh, something that the human brain tries to make sense of that may not actually make much sense. Uh, so you mentioned psychology and sociology. That sounds like to me like a good place to start. I, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's always, I think, interesting to me that these areas where they're you know, I, yeah, I think there are very easy inroads to be made to like, you know, uh, heavy, heavy science, right? Some real stuff going on. We kind of, uh, I think in one, on the one hand, people who believe in this stuff don't want to be told. I, I think there's a fear that if they go to uh, a scientific study or they put themselves out there for scrutiny, that they will be mocked or, um, you know, even even something kind of an academic view of say, you know, well, we don't think this actually happened to you. This might be another piece of evidence that shows that this is what occurred. Even that, I think, is a fearful experience for people, especially once they have this answer that they've been looking for. Right. right. And, you know, you kind of see that in the interplay. I mean, you, you see that really, I think, starkly in the Betty and Barney Hill case where, you know, they were told well, the hypnotist, this, this hypnotist does not necessarily think that what you're experiencing, what you're reliving is true here. But, you know, they went and said, well, we think it is. We think this is a real event that occurred to us. There's always been something of a disconnect between these fields of, say, psychology and uh, kind of belief in experiences. Mm -hmm. But there is still a lot of, I think, very useful information that can be garnered from it. Right. So, right. yeah. And, and what we don't really understand is, uh, in my opinion, I, we have, there's, there are lots of studies of perception. There are lots of studies of memory, but we don't really know much about how people perceive and remember things that make, that don't fit into their, their world model. Right. So. right. No, absolutely. I mean, we have, you know, it's interesting, actually, there are, there are some really interesting YouTube videos that kind of show this experiment a little bit where it, what it basically shows is a group of people sort of handing a, they have like a blue basketball or something. Oh yeah. I'm well, I'm well familiar with that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, the dinosaur walks behind them or whatever. And they're like, did you see the dinosaur? You know, for me, that's actually the kind of study that I think would be fascinating to do and look at in this case. Right. right. I mean, one, one question that I have actually, is are do so people who claim to see ufos or people even who claim to have been abducted or something like that is there something different about their ability to filter out noise in their environment and what i mean by that is that experiment with the dinosaur and the blue ball right are would they be able to turn off the dinosaur or would they notice it right right is it literally something functionally different about their mind or their brain, even their brain function, that allows them to maybe better pick apart and not filter out uh, things that go against the grain, like you're saying, yeah, right? That yeah. is a that is a great experiment 
that would not be particularly difficult to set up, <laughs> but it is one that has just never been done. You know, I, 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 I've often hypothesized, or I should say probably conjectured, I don't think it comes to the level of hypothesis, that there are people who have very sharply tuned anomaly filters and, and, and others that uh, basically filter out anomalies. And sure. Uh, so some people might be staring up at this guy and saying, what the hell is that? Well, everybody else is walking by them and saying, hey, it's nothing. It's a cloud, whatever, bird. Yeah. You know, it's funny, actually. One of my kind of pet – I don't know if pet theories or pet ideas, right? I guess, I guess like you said, maybe pet conjecture is a better word for it, right? But one of my own personal ones is these – I find it interesting, very interesting, how similar reports of – any kind of uh, personally shocking, unexplainable phenomena is, right? So whether that be you see a ghost or you, you know, have um, an abduction experience or any, anything of that same sort, right, where it's individually you are involved. I find it fascinating how similar a lot of those, a, a lot of those descriptions are. And a lot of the people, the way that they describe what occurred to them leading up to this event I find it fascinating how similar that is to descriptions, say, of um, of of uh, anxiety disorders, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to say that. That I mean, who knows? Maybe there is some kind of very uh, mundane. I mean, not necessarily mundane. Your brain can do all kinds of scary stuff to you, right? But still, perhaps there is a mundane explanation then, where it's you know, oh well, if you start, you know, what whatever it is, right? But I guess what I'm trying to say very badly because I'm trying not to offend anybody <laughs> is that I believe, or at least I have a suspicion that potentially the same kind of, uh, let's say just what you're describing, but that it would be, it would be part of say a phenotype of mental health uh, kind of conditions or mental health uh, things, traits that you have that make you more prone say to, um, anxiety disorders or disorders of, of compulsion or obsession or things like that. So that it's not simply that these events aren't there, right? We still don't know, regardless of what uh, an individual person observes or feels or whatever, we still don't really know if the event they're observing is true or not until we have objective evidence of that event. But this notion that perhaps it is that you are more inclined to notice those things or your brain is structured in such a way that you will not filter out those odd experiences, right? That to me, I think is, is very, very interesting. And again, the kind of stuff that I think any kind of psychologist, uh, you know, worth their salt working in this kind of field would love to get their love to sink their teeth into. Right. Uh, and if it only weren't a career limiting move, they very, very well do that. Well, you know what, you know what I think is actually interesting is, you know, for a lot of these, for a lot of these people, a lot of these fields, I think it what was once considered career limiting is is now really much more well, maybe not well accepted, but much more acceptable, at least. That's true. Right. I was surprised at the level of enthusiasm that I received from the skeptical community when I said I was going to be, um, you know, joining up with, uh, jo you know, really getting deeply into UFO research, right? And just this kind of research generally. I was very interested to find that there are actually a lot of very good, uh, very scientifically minded kind of people that would be considered skeptics, you know, and and kind of skeptic is used as a, as kind of a dirty word, right? I mean, right. It's, people don't want to be called skeptics anymore. They want to be called, you know, whatever. But I was surprised to find, and I mean, really, I've been surprised throughout my entire career, as short as it's been in the sciences um, so far, that, you know, every time you you pull up next to someone at a bar and you're like, you know, well, what do you research? And they'll they'll tell you whatever, you know, inevitably those conversations turn towards more, I guess, heady subjects, right? Things like consciousness and metaphysics and um, are we alone in the universe? Like these questions are, I think, they're fundamental questions to us as humans and eventually we're going to have to answer them, right? Or at least we're going to have to confront them more readily than we do now. Or ask better questions. And, or ask better questions, right? Yeah. Cause I mean, you know, eventually, I mean, it's my opinion that eventually, you know, uh, something's going to land, 
right and do it in a way that isn't isn't secret and hidden and whatever and when that day comes you know um what you know what <laughs> the people that have been looking at this stuff for a long time, or at least, in, at least enjoying the notion that this could be the case, um, you know, they're going to be a little bit ahead of the curve of everyone else. Right. Uh, now, um, let me ask you how, what about the role of field investigation and in, in all this, since, you know, API, basically that's all pretty much 90% of what we do. Uh, sure. And, uh, you know, I've often struggled with the notion that, Okay, we've been doing field investigation. Uh, we, you know, we in collective the community uh, since the early '50s, late '40s, and have not mm -hmm. uh, ever ha had a smoking gun case, in my opinion. Uh, and um, so, you know, the question is, why do we continue? And I, and I have my own thoughts on that, but I'd like to get yours. So, um, so actually, I kind of have two. I have two thoughts. First off. I think field investigation in any kind of um, – so I think a lot of people look at the question of UFOs as a question of physics, and I actually think that's the wrong way of looking at it. I think it's more of a question of – it is almost more of a question of biology or more of a question of sort of population dynamics, right? So I'm not even sure if that's the right even term for it, but – so, for instance, when – if you were going to try and prove that a disease was spreading through a population, you might try to find the germ. You might try to find that, uh, you know, a, a microscopic picture of the culprit, right, of the culprit organism that's causing this disease or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. You might try to find that underlying cause. But a much faster way potentially to find that thing and get to that root cause – would be to basically do a population analysis and look and see where is this disease spreading and try to find a source for it. Right? And that's kind of actually what they did with cholera uh, with, with uh, John snow, uh, not John snow of Winterfell, um, John snow of London, <laughs> right back in the um, back in the uh, 1860s, 1870s, maybe somewhere around there, you know, when uh, basically by pinpointing where these cases were occurring on a map, and looking at this as a question of large swaths of data as opposed to individual cases, he was able to pinpoint, well, all of these cholera cases seem to be coming from the same water fountain, right? Mm -hmm. And they were able to pinpoint and say, well, cholera spreads by spreads via water, right? And this was really one of the foundational questions of – or one of the foundational findings of uh, the germ theory of disease. I think something very similar – is going to happen eventually in the UFO field. Now, again, if that shows that um, we may not ever, so so what I'm trying to say, I guess, is we may not ever get a smoking gun case, but we may be able to find in the data enough there to prove at least beyond a reasonable doubt to uh, anyone with any kind of knowledge of, you know, statistics and kind of good scientific practice we might be able to prove a conclusion whichever way we come down on it, right? So, right. for instance, our group is currently looking at the uh, statistical trends and specifically looking at the uh, various markers and really the, the statistics people on my team are far smarter than I am about that stuff. I hated statistics in college. Hmm. Um, <laughs> you know, it's why I went into material science because – all of our experiments happen, you know, once or twice or three times, maybe if you're really lucky and really good at making the same crystal. So, uh, but they're looking at these statistics and, and picking out these metrics that specifically will show or hopefully show, is there a difference, say, between the frequency of sightings across a population of a real event or a hoax event, right? Mm -hmm. Or what we would consider to be a real event versus a hoax event. Is it true that um, is it true that UFOs appear near water, right? That is a common trope that's put out there, but really has never been answered. It's it's never been looked at, right? And you know, uh, questions even of say, are there really UFO hotspots, right? Or is it just that our populations tend to cluster around bodies of water or you know well, industry do, yeah. or whatever, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, if, I, it looks to me like the statistics, the sighting statistics, pretty much follow population density. 
uh, which, you know, not surprising, right? No, well, that's the thing, right? So, um, but again, if it was a hoax or if these were not real cases, we might expect them to follow a different sort of pattern, let's say, in the overall trends of the data, right? So we're kind of trying – so the way that our kind of group is trying to look at this is we are trying to pick apart this question in a more rigorous way than it's been looked at before. I think the, the issue with just looking at, at this as a case-by-case -case basis – is you may not ever find that smoking gun case, but I mean, we get, you know, there are, uh, there are thousands of cases reported every month, right? All across the internet to different groups and whatever. There are thousands of these investigations ongoing at any one given time. All of that data could be collected, could be mined and could be looked at to say, I mean, you know, for instance, I mean, I don't think anyone at this point in time really knows what is the most common type of craft observed in their local area, right? If someone asked me, what is the most common craft type observed in Minnesota right now? I would hazard a guess. I would say maybe it's, I don't know, triangles, maybe it's orbs, maybe it's, you know, the, the pie tin cigar shaped, whatever. Right. But really even that question is interesting and potentially useful for investigations. Right. Uh, and uh, do we, is it just, so we, we have, what are some of the dimensions? I mean, you mentioned uh, place, you mentioned shape, you mentioned, uh, um, you know, hoax versus authentic. I don't know. I'm not sure how we determine authentic, but uh, you know, yeah. are there some other, what, <laughs> What are some of the more interesting uh, sort of slices of the data you think we might be able to look at? I mean, so that's the that's the thing, right? So I am, like I said, I'm I'm a material scientist. I'm not a uh, I'm not a statistician per se, but I have I have some ideas. I have places that I hope our team is going to be looking at, and kind of where I'm trying to hope to guide them towards. Um, one interesting one is the frequency of sightings, right? Right. Uh, so literally, how many sightings do we see per? day uh per year per person right so this kind of very specific type of metric you know what kind of distributions do sightings take on over time right so do sightings tend to cluster more towards um a frequency that's kind of at the middle of the range so in other words you know let's say your middle your average or your median is uh let's say on average your sightings occur once every three days well that might be different than say a hoax which a hoax occurs or a hoax is propagated let's say once every six days right but then also the shape of that distribution so real cases maybe would take a standard distribution whereas um you know hoaxes maybe are tail heavy or front heavy or whatever we those kinds of information pieces are also very very useful and uh you know, and, and the thing is, too, I think there's a lot of analogy to be, to be drawn between, let's say, looking at the, uh, let's say, for instance, another area of science where there is oftentimes um, hoaxing and also real, uh, real events occurring, which would be medicine, right? Mm -hmm. If we look, say, at the, uh, at the percentage of uh, people who, say, report that they have, uh, you know, a placebo work for them versus a real piece of medication. Those distributions, I mean, it's different stuff. They're different tests, but still potentially there might be something in that the way that those distributions uh, come out, the kind of metrics that they can apply to them, right? So um, kind of these, in, in engineering, we would call them dimensionless factors or uh, kind of these variables that are, um, these variables that are, indicative of a system regardless of the system that are applied to right right so so long as the system is somewhat similar they can still be applied so in engineering and chemical engineering we have one called the reynolds number and the reynolds number describes basically the um, viscous forces in a flow um, across a pipe and the shape of the pipe can be different the type of liquid can be different all that stuff can be different you know but still if the reynolds number is say um I don't know, whatever, two, you know, 20, 200,000, then that means you have turbulent flow. And that's going to be true regardless of the shape of the pipe or the type of fluid or whatever. 
similar things might be able to be told in these uh, large population dynamics. So it's really a matter of getting the right people involved and also kind of, I think, part of that is selling it to them that this can really be useful science, right? Or this can at least be worthwhile science for them. Right. I mean, you're probably going to end up with more questions than answers, but sure. you have better <laughs> questions. Right? Yeah. 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 I mean, I didn't, I didn't really get, I guess I didn't really give a great answer to your actual question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I would say some of the things that I would look for would be population density versus the densities of cases, right? Mm -hmm. I would look for, a, I would look for the geographic distance between cases, right? Because that would tell us potentially where a hotspot actually is versus isn't. So for instance, if we're out in the middle of the desert where there are no people, we would expect to see very few sightings. And so that kind of uh, sighting density would be greater than say around a city, right? right? But I suspect that what we might find is that actually, uh, there are other factors at play such as, you know, light pollution or um, literally the ability of someone to kind of focus on the sky versus being out in the open. Those kinds of things are, are factors that we're going to have to try to account for later on. Another thing that I would look for would be, um, would be for instance, the shape of the craft or the lighting patterns um, versus say, so, the question that I think we were getting to, which was really your central, a very good point that you made, was how do we actually differentiate between the hoaxes and the real cases? Right. Right. That is a not, I mean, you know, <laughs> anytime you're studying people and what people think about something, that is the challenge, right? How many people have real, uh, real things or real issues or whatever versus have kind of, um, you know, are, are, are building it up to be bigger or are just making it up or whatever. Anytime you're probing what people feel or what people believe, that's very, very difficult. So the challenge, I think, or one of the most important things that we should do is go through our cases, uh, all of them, basically put them into a digitized format. So some kind of, it could be as simple as an Excel sheet mm -hmm. and literally rank each case based on the investigation, the investigator's knowledge of the case, and then look for commonalities in cases that are very good and in cases that are hoaxes and in cases that are just so, so, right. And we, and we already have, I think every investigator has that kind of list in their mind already of what to them makes a very interesting case. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, we do that at API. We, when we finish a case, uh, we ask each investigator to rate it for probability on a scale of yes. one to five and strangers on a scale of one to five. And we have some fairly detailed criteria for that. And uh, sure. so that allows us to go and plot, you know, strangers versus probability. And and the vast majority of the cases are strangeness one uh, sure. and, and probability two or three. Maybe and then, but there's a, those outliers, and those are the cases right. that we'd like to know more about, right? Right. Well, those, and that's the thing is that you know. So it's interesting, actually. So you you mentioned you know API's own specific standards. Um, that's actually one question that we get a lot from people is everyone has their own standards. So then, how do you actually analyze? You know, if the if what counts as a good case to you know. Uh, whatever, you know, some guy over here is different than what counts as a good case for some lady over on this side, right? Then it's much more difficult to kind of put those two things together. But really that's the good thing about potentially putting these things into kind of a, uh, kind of a more accessible format is that the right. criteria that you look for, you know, it, it, it may not necessarily matter if the individual investigator, I mean, that's something that has to be taken into account, of course, but ultimately, what we're looking for are trends that should uh, – ba basically, the trends that should overcome those beliefs, right, right or those ideas. You know, Because, again, there are going to be things – if you asked a UFO investigator in the 80s, you know, what did they think a, an alien occupant of a UFO would look like, they would have a very specific type of answer, right? right? Versus today, the answer kind of has become more blurred over time. And you'll even have people say, you know, well, 
I don't think there are occupants or, you know, I don't, you know, um, all kinds of more kind of interesting answers today. So those are the, also the other pieces that we need to look out for are kind of, I think, um, and that actually might be an easier question. And that's kind of the way that science should be done. In my opinion is, uh, you should be trying to falsify tests, not prove tests, right? We're never going to prove that a, I mean, you know, Descartes had a very hard time proving that he existed, right? <laughs> Forget trying to prove that some other alien life form exists, right? Right. So the best that we can do is try to disprove cases and try to um, kind of pick away at those pieces of evidence that we think are good and throw everything we can at them. And then those pieces that stick around, those pieces that withstand the test of time, those are going to be kind of the the sort of central tenets around which we build this overall process. Right. Uh, and I, that I'm encouraged to hear that uh, because I've always been saying that, you know, uh, proof is for mathematicians, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, we, we just, we're trying to accumulate evidence and evidence requires a hypothesis or it's not, it's just data. Right. right. So, so uh, what are some of the hypotheses we could test near term? I mean, so I think that actually a lot of the, I think a lot of the interesting hypotheses that we could test right now, even with the data that we have available, um, is those questions of say geography or those questions of these larger ideas that are out there in the, in the kind of, you know, the cultural soup, so to speak. Right. So, um, you know, do UFOs appear on average, even accounting for population density more around certain bodies of water than others, mm -hmm. right? Or do they just, they don't care about water. Do they appear more often than not around nuclear facilities right, or military bases? Do they appear, um, is there one shape or one coloration, one kind of pattern of lighting that is more, uh, more present in some of these geographic areas than others, right? right? All of those are questions that could be answered, um, I don't want to say quickly because, you know, uh, if there is one thing that science is not, it is quick. But, you know, all of those are questions. Those are questions we, we, we could answer potentially. Yes, absolutely. There are things that we could we could put those out there. We could then test them and then we could at least see does our data bear out these ideas. Yeah. Um, you know, some other ones I think that would be really I, I think would be very interesting would be things that are kind of already going on in the realm of say academic psychology sort of, which would be, you know, what, uh, what is the overall say? So we often hear that people who believe in UFOs are uh, gullible or they are easy to convince with little bits of evidence or whatever, right? They kind of have these spiritual or these larger ideals around them that allow them to be susceptible to these kinds of ideas. Right. Well, anecdotally, we've all met people like that, right? I mean, Right. Well, that's the thing, though. Anecdotally, we all have. I don't care about anecdotes, right? I want the evidence, right. you know. Is is that even true? And if it is true, can we then build a better reporting format or even a better um, – it's so important that we know the biases of our investigators, right? So, you know, if someone's claimed that – if someone like – you know, someone very kind of spiritual and, uh, you know, crystals and all that stuff. If they have a sighting, you probably don't want to send me out to talk to them. Right. Cause mm -hmm. I am not, my biases are such that I am not going to take them fairly. Right. I'm not really, you know, and it's something I know about myself. It's very important that we know that before we actually do these investigations. And it's important that we find a method to kind of limit that stuff from the results. Right. Um, and and uh, I have to say my own attitude towards high strangeness cases has changed over the, sure. the since I started investigating them. We don't we don't do a lot of high strangeness, but, uh, you know, uh, my notion was that if I talked to somebody who thought they'd had a lot of very bizarre experiences that I would immediately say this is a lunatic, right? A crazy mm -hmm. person. And I'm done here. But that is not what happened. You know, mm. <laughs> uh, that people who clearly very upset or, or distressed about their experience, but not, you know, they, they're perfectly functional in, in every other way. 
And so, uh, you know, and one of our very first cases that we worked was with someone like that. And the only really interesting physical evidence I've ever seen was in a case like that, uh, even though it wasn't conclusive physical evidence, but it was sure. it was a little bit, which is better than none. <laughs> but uh, yeah, oh hey, that's great. A little bit is a little bit in this field is amazing. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, well, yeah, evidence that that something some small artifact he found had disappeared mysteriously, and and mm. I ended up finding that there was that was consistent with the evidence that we had, uh, but. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the actual, the kinds of cases where you talk to somebody like that, a lot of times, uh, you know, they may have taken refuge in a lot of metaphysical beliefs, mm -hmm. uh, for different reasons throughout their lives, but it, it, it's, uh, some of them are very, very religious, uh, mm -hmm. and, but that doesn't, I don't think that really destroys their credibility completely. No, that's, and that's kind of, I think that's another kind of answer or another, uh, at least another kind of area where I think working with, uh, working with academic psychology or science could actually help us kind of pretty significantly in my mind in these questions say of, you know, um, I guess, you know, so the, so like you said, I've actually had similar experiences where I thought I was going to be talking to someone that would just, I would be you know, I'd be, I'd be chuckling under my breath and maybe, you know, like I'd leave there and just be like, oh my goodness, I can't believe this person. And then, you know, you go home and you sleep with the lights on, you know, <laughs> just it, 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 uh, it, their, their credibility and their earnestness and their clear, um, trauma, right. Hits you. It's, it just, it happens. And you're like, oh my goodness, this really happened to this person. You know, I never thought this could happen. It's, but I think that we do have to be uh, – there is kind of an uncomfortable area between, say, you know, what do we consider a paranormal experience or a UFO experience or an abduction or whatever versus, say, a, a mental health event or, you know, a repressed memory of some kind of more deep trauma or different type of trauma, I guess, right? Right. And so I think getting that settled – is that's still a question that's out there in the UFO field and even the use of hypnotism. I mean, you know, uh, there is no evidence that hypnotism works. And in fact, there's evidence that it's, it actually hurts people. Right. Right. Yeah. We, so, we recommend against it. Absolutely. Well, that's the thing. There are some groups that are, that are doing this the right way that'll say that. Right. And then you got other groups that are just like, you know, oh well, yeah, you know, we got, we got hypnotists on call 24 seven. Right. Um, you know, and wouldn't you know it, I get a finder's fee every time I give out their card. You know, isn't that, yeah. isn't that great? Yeah. Um, you know, wonderful stuff. So the challenge I think is to be able to, even if we say had a very quick questionnaire that could then be used to gauge the bias of the, uh, of the witness and the bias of the, the person taking in that, that test, right. Or formatting the questionnaire in such a way that it removes implicit bias. Um, that is the kind of stuff that we could get, you know, uh, statisticians and people that make these kinds of tests for a living get involved and help us. Right. And then that way, again, collect evidence that is sort of beyond um, at least above kind of these questions of say uh, tainting or ethical, you know, standards or whatever, you know? Yeah. Well, a, a psychological instrument like that would be great. I mean, you could, especially you can, especially you can show that it's somehow correlated with beliefs yes. uh, about uh, strange things. Uh, and uh, I don't want to use the term weird because, you know, I think that usually is pejorative, but uh, um, the, uh, now here's, I, here's an hypothesis. I, 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 again, more of a conjecture, but something I'd like to th toss at you and see what you think of it. Um, one of the hypotheses about this, these phenomena, and I don't know if it's one phenomena or many, you know, mm. or many, uh, but uh, is that it? It's indifferent to human observation. And, yeah, that's it. yeah. So, and that it appears uh, wherever it appears, regardless of who's watching or uh, what they think of it, and and there might be a way to test that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so that is actually one of the. One of the big, I think, 
underlying assumptions, let's say, that goes into this field is we assume that whatever or we did assume that whatever it was that was coming here, whatever it is that's coming here, um, didn't or or wanted to hide, wanted to be covert about its actions, right? Right. And that was an assumption that dominated the investigation of these cases for a long time. And I think like, you know, like you said, that has changed now to where, you know, you have people, I mean, I'm just, I'm just now rereading uh, communion and, you know, he mentions being abducted out of a train car in like the middle of the day. You know what I mean? <laughs> like right. that, if they have the kind of technology that allows them to transport themselves across you know, space to come to our solar system, um, it's likely they'd be able to, you know, uh, kind of, I guess, travel or operate in a way that might seem supernatural to us, but is actually just preternatural, right? To kind of borrow a phrase from, um, that's sort of, again, that's actually kind of the bad argument they use to kind of try to prove or try to explain how um, witchcraft could work, (laughs) you know? So maybe that's not the best way to start our argument here, but... I would say, though, in my mind, if they don't care that we are looking at them, then they would operate, say, similar to a um, almost similar to an animal that is not afraid of humans. Right. So, for instance, it is much easier to observe, um, I don't know, a, a herd of buffalo, right, or an elephant. Elephants are so huge that they don't care. Uh, they're not getting they're not being uh, predated on that much right? right so they operate in a different way than say a squirrel does or a mouse or something that is being uh, you know under constant threat basically of being eaten so yeah i would say that if that's the case then um we should see no distribution say in see but the the problem is how do we pick that apart from say just human um humans ability to observe these things right because i for instance i would argue one thing that we might notice is that the time of day doesn't really matter right right because if they're not trying to hide then why should they come at night or the face of the moon perhaps or the phase of the moon or whatever right yeah actually actually the phase of the moon is a much better one but i was thinking daytime versus nighttime the phase of the moon is actually a very fascinating one that's that's a pretty good one another one might be too um, do they care how many witnesses are present or do they not care? Right. So for instance, you know, uh, we, I, I heard a case where a gentleman said, you know, he, he noticed a ship come, uh, not really, he didn't describe it as a ship. He described it as like a fireball, but basically it was kind of zigging around, uh, up above his car. And there were other cars on the street that just didn't care. People just kept driving by him, you know? So uh, what would be fascinating, I think, actually, would be digging into that data and seeing, well, how many cases do we have that it's just one person versus it's in a public place versus it's in a you know high population density area? There might be a way to kind of suss that out of the data, but I'm – I don't know. I think it's an interesting idea. Well, one thing that, that I did think of uh, – I'm not sure how to pull it off yet, but uh, if you could put an area that has a decent number of sightings per year under – airspace surveillance, you know, pretty, pretty good surveillance, um, optical or cameras or whatever IR, uh, and see if that has any influence on the number of sightings, whether it's on or off, you know, uh, Oh, that's actually very interesting as well. Whether, Hmm. So something kind of, I don't know if obvious is the right word, but something almost like, um, are they going to be? Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, it you, is very interesting. You'd have, you know, you could do with human sky watching teams. Although getting enough good sky watchers could be difficult. But sure. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, the other the other way to maybe look at it would be say, is there again? This is kind of pulling. This is pulling more out of the data than is probably good to pull from it. But for instance, saying. If let's say we find that actually there is a higher percentage of sightings, um, even accounting for things like, say, population density and all this other stuff, that there are actually more sightings out in the wilderness far away from big, uh, big population centers than there are in the cities, 
that might suggest an effort to disguise uh, what they're doing or something, right? Or rather making it easier on themselves. Another thing might be um, radar, you know, in, in areas with very clear radar towers or very high radar signals. Um, I actually don't know all that much about radar to be able to say this conclusively, but I wonder that same thing too. Could we kind of triangulate areas with high uh, radar signal or uh, high radar kind of stations that can actually measure this uh, sort of information? Do we see less sightings around those than in other areas? It's kind of interesting. You know, I, I don't know. I think it's a good idea though. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a, it, it'd be tricky to work out, but uh, you know, I think it, it is possible, at least a principal answer to the question is, uh, are, are well-authenticated UFO sightings indifferent to human observation or not? Or, or even or right. do, do they or do they specifically target specific people? Uh, right, right, right. Yeah, that's true. You know, what, you know what I actually think is really interesting? This was something that I – the question that is often brought up with these things is – well, why hasn't anyone caught any good data yet, right? Why hasn't anyone taken a good photo yet or a good video or something? And actually, to me, the answer is pretty simple. It's that we still don't – we don't know how to predict where they will be, right, or where right. these this event will take place. I keep saying what where they will be, where this event will take place. We still have no really good way of predicting where it will occur. You know, aside from, I don't know, a ranch in, in Utah – Right. We really don't have any kind of central hotspots to look at. Right. Yeah. So and that's kind of that's why I think that's really a, a first question to ask is, you know, we might find that, you know, there's some, I don't know, UFO Mecca out there in the plains of Iowa or something. Right. That no one ever would have thought of. That is this area that has a very, very high concentration of sightings. And so, you know. Uh, the same way that we do when we are we go looking for uh, photographs of rare animals or evidence of them, mm. we don't we don't go out there, you know, with uh, with a camera and go looking for three days in the jungle, then call it quits. We stake out that location for months, <laughs> right? right, and set up trail cameras and you know carefully monitor and look for signs that okay, well, this is actually evidence that this thing that we're looking for is really there. That still hasn't even really been done in the UFO field. You know what I mean? It's and it's a huge challenge, but that is really where it has to it really has to start from, in my mind, is can we begin to at least get a handle on where this is occurring, how often, um, what times are most likely, all that stuff, to then maybe put out, you know, a group of a group of cameras or five five you know people with binoculars and, and good uh video cameras or whatever right like can we actually get out there and get there to uh, look at this stuff in a way that is more systematic yeah and and uh you know uh the, the three or four good sightings i've had uh sure only one did i have a camera and it was an old film camera and failed to capture anything uh so even though i know something was there <laughs> You know, right, uh, right. So uh, now I've got an art, you know, uh, this armada of photography gear, and I'm ready. But of course, <laughs> I'll right, probably, well, probably never see anything. <laughs> right, right now, yeah. Now you know they're uh, they're checking your uh, Amazon account. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. oh, he's got the cameras now. Now we'll you know now we'll never show up. Oh, he can do I mean, ISO, ISO like, what? Yeah, okay. <laughs> right. Turn the lights off. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, I mean, it's kind of like it's the same thing. People ask, you know, well, how come you never got how come no one's ever gotten a you know really good photo or anything like that? You know, especially with cell phones being around today. I mean, it takes me like a good five, you know, like a good 50 seconds to pull my stupid phone out of my pocket. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, flip it on and then get to the camera app and then get it focused and whatever. Like, you know, I, I don't have a chance of getting, I don't know. I don't have a chance of getting my cat in a cute position on the couch before she moves over. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I, I really don't understand that argument. I think, you know, it to me that the the path ahead is uh, is predictive or at least at least kind of trying to get a sense of where our probability is best and then staking out those areas. Hmm. And and uh, now 
you mentioned earlier that uh, that maybe what used to be a career limiting move isn't so much anymore. Sure. Uh, for, uh, is it possible uh, that we could get to the point where uh, a promising young scientist might consider her career in studying at least part of her time studying UFOs? So the challenge is going to be how you how you put that study onto a larger line of scientific or academic kind of pedigree, right? right. How do you put it onto the family tree of real science and, and real uh, discourse, real, real scientific work, real academic work? The, you know, so for instance, in my research lab, uh, when I did my PhD, two of my projects were things that had applications that are still science fiction, right? So one of my projects was creating um, creating a, a material that was able to withstand such high doses of radiation and heat that it would allow for travel, um, you know, ver- basically much, much more efficient um, space travel because you would not need as much shielding on a, on a surface of a ship, right? right? And the other one was the creation of a material that would be allowed, uh, be able to be used as basically a rebreather. So, um, again, for extended space flight or, or space travel, you have a, uh, instead of carrying thousands of pounds of oxygen tanks with you, you carry, you know, uh, five kilograms of this material, this catalyst that absorbs uh, CO2 from the air and then catalytically converts it back into oxygen and then kind of dumps out carbon, right? Mm. So that is a concept that is currently being worked on in labs around the country, around the world, really. And it is definitely, I would say, science fiction, right? It is something that we would not consider to be possible by today's standards. Well, plants can um, do that, right? I mean... But... Oh, absolutely. Actually, the, the project... <laughs> The project or the idea in science is called the uh, it's called a synthetic plant, oh. right? Or or material photosynthesis. Cool. It's the same idea, cool. and actually, a lot of labs are trying to do it using uh, light energy, you know. But the problem is, the problem with a lot of these catalytic things is that the you're trying to make a process better for the environment, but the catalyst you have to use is like really terrible for the environment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you're like, oh yeah, I'm saving, you know. I'm saving 300 gallons of water a day, but I'm also, you know, dumping deadly, deadly arsenic into the, into the land, you know? So it's not often great, but anyways. um, So I would actually say that if we put it in that line of thinking, or if we can connect it to an actual academic discipline, then I think the chances are very good. I mean, for instance, not to get into kind of the sticky, uh, the sticky situations of politics or whatever. Right. But uh, one question that's extremely important right now for public discourse is how do you, how do you teach people? How do you teach the public science? How do you get them to believe um, scientific things versus non-scientific or mythological or conspiracy things? That is a question that has been fundamental to the study of UFOs since its beginning. Right. Right. And yet we and yet we are not, you know, we we have not spent any time really answering that question as a group, as a as a uh, research kind of uh, force of people. But that is an area where the study of this phenomena, again, could kind of gently push its way towards um, an academic standing. Right. Another area would be, like we said earlier, psychology, right, or sociology or uh, populations and, and these ideas of big data, right. all of those things are nice avenues where the UFO question again, and that's another part of this too, that the study of UFOs does not have to be the study of even sightings or the study of, uh, you know, exo politics or any of that stuff. It does not have to, it doesn't even necessarily have to include um, really any study of UFOs as we properly understand them. There could be studies of, say, um, how do ideas propagate, right? How do um, how do kind of notions, say, of larger folklore or um, ideas, larger pieces of information spread across a group, right? Why is it that some um, why is it that some UFO groups 
you know, uh, stick to a very scientific skeptical approach while others kind of start bending more towards metaphysics or religion or, um, you know, even more kind of, uh, exotic viewpoints. Right. Right. Um, all of those are questions that could be very, very interesting, very, very fruitful for the UFO community. But I think that we have been, first off, I think we have not been, uh, we have not been treated super great by science in the past. <laughs> right. I mean, there's, well, there we really haven't, we haven't always deserved to be treated super great. right? No. And that's, well, that's the thing too, right. Is that actually, I think it's interesting. I have had, you know, when, when I uh, first put out the call for researchers to kind of help us, um, what I found was people who were very, very well trained, extremely smart, academically, you know, great kind of academic rigor, great backgrounds, all this stuff who wanted to come and do this stuff. Cause they have been watching, you know, star Trek and star Wars and talking about UFOs with their friends, their entire lives. Right. Hmm. The only backlash, the only resistance I've gotten has been from kind of the old guard, I guess you'd say of the UFO community, right. Who don't want, um, who don't want, in my opinion, at least don't want real science to get involved who don't want to see this field move past where it's been because I mean, I don't know why. Right. But um, that has been my experience at least so far. It's, it's, it's actually, it was much, it was, I was very surprised to find that that was the case in my, um, in my viewpoint anyways. Hmm. Well, yeah, I, I guess uh, I've seen a little of that myself, but not as much as you have probably. Uh, sure. The, uh, we have we did do an investigation uh, out in New Mexico a number of years ago uh, where somebody handed us a twisted piece of aluminum and they said I know this came from a from a crash flying saucer and stamped on this aluminum was the letter a <laughs> you know by a conventional stamping process you could sure uh, and uh, <laughs> Right, right. Uh, you know, United, United Aluminum. You know, what I mean? yeah. whoa. <laughs> and, and my, and my, my, my colleague uh, tracked it down to specific aircraft and a specific uh, part of that aircraft that 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 actually did crash in New Mexico in the in the late forties, actually in the oh, mid forties. Uh, so, uh, well, a lot of training flights in those days crashed. Sure, uh, sure. it was it was wartime, and you know, it they couldn't be too they couldn't be careful, but. Uh, the, um, the, you know, that, that kind of, but still there was this belief that this must be a piece of a flying saucer because we found it where we think the flying saucer crashed. And, uh, we, what we found was no evidence that any flying saucer ever crashed there, but, right. uh, you know, and, but simply saying there's no evidence or there's no good evidence, uh, or there's, you know, there's testimony from someone's childhood memories doesn't change the fact well yeah but somebody said it happened so we've chosen to believe it uh right and you know so it sometimes you know and i have a lot of friends in the skeptical community who's who i will tell them look if you don't want to believe that ufos are real i don't have anything to dissuade you sure uh, i can show you i can tell you about my own personal experiences i can show you lots of little bits of evidence but i can't mm -hmm. say there's a there's a open and shut case here. You don't have to believe it if you don't want to. And they'll, a lot of times they'll say, thank you. We don't want to. And, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> that's right. it. That, that's the end of that conversation. Uh, yeah. and, uh, so, um, and you know, I, I'd rather, I'd rather have an open question and an unanswered question than, than a dogmatic belief myself. So, uh, yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. And With, so I, okay. So what I actually find very interesting to that story or at least kind of, uh, so when I, when I was in undergrad, I wanted, so I started out as a chemical engineering major. And uh, the reason I did that was because I found out that theoretical physics or theoretical physicist wasn't a real job, <laughs> really. Right. <Yeah. laughs> you know, physicist is a job um, and professor of physics is a job, but those jobs are hard to come by. Yes. So I, I decided, okay, well I'll do, I'll do something else. And I was interested in nanotechnology. So I was like, well, there's a lot of research going on in that field in chemistry and chemical engineering. I'll stick to that. So I uh, went in for chemical engineering and within my first semester, I fell in love with philosophy. Um, you know, as, as hard as I thought I was going to love it when I first wanted to do 
uh, theoretical physics and kind of, you know, grow up to be uh, Michio Kaku, right? So, but I, uh, when I brought to my professors in chemical engineering that I wanted a double major, that, you know, they were just dumbfounded. They were like, why? Who cares about philosophy, right? <laughs> yeah. it's, probably, it's probably been much more useful uh, in my professional career than anything I did in undergrad in chemical engineering, right? Um, you know, it got me through grad school. It helps me write. Like, you know, philosophy was extremely useful to me. And I think the same kind of bias occurs with these other kind of non, you know, and I think that is the challenge that we have been trying to sell UFO research as a um, as a type of engineering or a type of physics, right? And what we should be trying to do, in my opinion, is broaden that definition to include almost a almost a philosophy of I don't know if a philosophy of UFOs is the wrong word because it makes it sound like I'm a uh, like a Barnes and Noble cheap pop philosophy book. Yeah, I get <laughs> but, it. <laughs> but you know what we need to do though is broaden this field to be more about, um, or at least to put those metaphysical questions, those questions that. Um, you know, these broader ideas about what it means to be human and how could we even uh, communicate with a different brain that that evolved on a different planet. All these much more uh, bigger, interesting questions could be answered and are the kinds of questions being answered by philosophers of science and of, uh, you know, uh, epistemology and, and uh, kind of naturalist philosophers. But we've kind of almost cordoned ourselves off from them by trying to sell the study of UFOs as we're looking for a ship, we're looking for an engine, we're looking for, you know, uh, we're looking for a piece of metal, right? right. We, we need to be looking, we need to be looking much more broadly than that at this evidence. Yeah. Okay. That that's interesting perspective. I, I, uh, maybe we should close with that. Uh, since I've kept you for an hour already. Uh, <laughs> it's been a great time. Yeah. I, I love talking about this stuff. I'm, yeah. I'm always uh, open. Yeah. Well, um, this, uh, first conversation i've done in in a while mostly marcia barnhart disease but uh the uh i think it's been great to have you on uh as we know that you recently resigned from director of research at mufon and that, that story is pretty well known i'm not going to rehash it here but we'll have links in the show notes if anybody wants to know about your resignation letter and so forth i'm glad to see you're carrying on with your research nonetheless of course no you know what uh you know what you know one door closes another three open right so right. that's kind of the way we're looking at it um you know if if anyone listening to this wants to get involved wants to help us with our with our work um you know shoot me an email chris f cogswell at gmail.com um you know you feel free to post that here with the notes too i will and you know we we are uh, we are absolutely moving ahead so you know our uh, i think our our team of you know 15 kind of uh scientist we kind of took a breather that one day of my resignation and then since then we've just been kind of moving forward so oh. <laughs> so it's uh, good good to hear it yeah and uh please yeah. keep us posted on on what you're learning Absolutely. okay well thanks a lot chris uh and uh we hope to hear from you again before too much longer absolutely anytime okay, okay. bye 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 Once again, I'd like to thank our guest on Conversation 10 here, Chris Cogswell. And if you want more information, it will be in the show notes. You can either go to www.apicasefiles.com or you can go to our main site, aerial-phenomenon.org. There will be links in the show notes to more information about Chris, about why he resigned from MUFON, and how you can contact him if you want to get involved with his scientific enterprise related to UFOs. If you need to report a UFO, go to reportauFO.org. That's R-E-P-O-R-T-A-U-F-O.org and fill out the form there. And we will get back to you very soon. And if it's the kind of case we can investigate, we'll assign a field investigator and we'll be in touch with you. API Case Files and API Conversations is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike License. Music by DJ Spooky. <laughs>